Okay, so our last topic for this course, yay, is power series. And um, I'm going to start off, start off with just a quick definition and then examples. And then we're slowly going to get to study them. So, um, a power series, so let, let's write... Um, Let's write it like this. So, sigma, do I want, yeah, I want n's. And in, in, we're going to start n from 0. You'll see why in, in a few minutes. Sigma n equals 0 to infinity. A n, this thing was just a number series, a regular series that we've been discussing so far. But now I'm going to add x to the power n. This thing is called a power series. So this is the definition and remarks one when we write x we mean it's a variable, right? That's how we think of x's. But for every fixed x you put in, for any, let's call it x naught to emphasize that now it's a fixed number, what do you get if you put a fixed number here? You get a regular series. We get a regular series or a number series. Those are the ones we've been discussing so far. We'll do examples in just a second. These ANs, ANs are called, do you know? They're called the coefficients, coefficients. And that's related to the third remark that you can think of this think of this, we think of this thing, of sigma a n x to the power n, as a polynomial, but a polynomial of an infinite degree, as a polynomial of infinite degree. Because let's spell this out. Let's see what's written here. So when n equals 0, we get a0 times x to the power 0. x to the power 0 is 1, right? So we get a0 plus a1 x to the power 1, a1 x plus a2 x squared and so on. So this is precisely a polynomial, well not precisely, it's almost a polynomial. The difference is that a polynomial has a highest power which determines its degree. And here there's no highest power, they just go on and on and on. Do you agree? And that's why these ANs are called the coefficients and Th this way of thinking is, is, is hiding in, in more than just a way of thinking. It's, it's, it it hi hides some truths about these things and we'll slowly discover them as we proceed. <coughs> okay, let's do examples. Best thing is examples. So example number one. Let's look at sigma n equals, I'm going to start it from one n equals 1 to infinity, one, o 1 over n x to the power n. I'm starting from 1 because if I start from 0, it won't be defined. Okay? So let's, let's spell this out. So what do I get? I get, when n equals 1, I get x plus x squared over 2 plus x to the power 3 over 3 plus dot, dot, dot. Do you agree that this is what we have here. So what are the coefficients? What are the ANs? 1 over n. Okay, so 
ANs are, these are the, let's, where's blue? Here you are. So these are the ANs. Okay. And let's start plugging in numbers. So if we plug in x0 to be just 0. So if I put a 0 here, or zeros whenever I see x, what do I get? I get a sum of zeros. Do you agree? What's a sum of zeros? It's zero, right? And in particular, it converges. So when x0 is zero, we get a converging series. And in this case, we even know its sum. Its sum is just zero. Does everybody agree? What if we plug in, instead of zero, what if we plug in, for example, one? We get sigma, 1 over n, 1 to the power n. What's 1 to the power n? It's always 1, so I'm just not going to write it. So we get the harmonic series. Do you agree? So what about this? What do you know about the harmonic series? Diverges. So for different x's, we get different phenomena. At 0, it converges. At 1, it diverges. Let's see some more. What if we plug in x0 equals negative 1? What do we get? Right, we, we had a name for it. Right, we get the alternating harmonic series, which converges, why? By Leibniz theorem. So maybe let's write here, diverges, harmonic, converges, Leibniz. Yeah, my blacks are dying out. New one. Okay, let's try something else. How about x0 equals 2? So we get sum. 1 over n, and I'm plugging in a 2 here, 2 to the n. What can you say about this? Di okay, so if you're going to say diverges, give us a clue to how you got to that. Same for converges, so people here are saying this diverges. I agree, but why? Okay, so I got like five different answers, and... By stereo, or not, this is not stereo, this is surround, but, uh, but I picked all of them up, they're all <laughs> correct. Okay, so you can say, th this is 2 to the n over n, you can say the sequence doesn't go to 0, true. You can run the ratio test or the root test on this, true. You can compare it to, to 1 over n, it's bigger, diverge. So this diverges by almost any possible test you try to, to apply to it. Do you agree? Good? Okay, but, but if that was too fast for you, okay, what I, all I just said now, you should try it. You should get good feeling and good uh, working knowledge for this. Okay, so try applying the root test, the ratio test, the comparison test, showing that this doesn't go to zero. Do all of them. Okay, you should feel really um, good about this. Okay. What about x0 equals, what else did I try? One third. So if I plug in one third here, I get sum 1 over n, that's this thing, times one third to the power n, or n times 3 to the n. Right? What can you say about this thing? Okay, so you're right, it converges. There are probably several ways to argue this as well. I used the ratio test, for example. No, what did I use? The root test. Uh, for example, the root test. So what would be the root test? I would have to take the nth root 
of the, of the of the sequence, so it would be one over the nth root of n three to the n. And check what the limit of this thing is when n goes to infinity. Right? It's positive. I can use the the root test. So I get one over the nth root of three to the n is just three, and then I have the nth root of n here, which goes to one. So as n goes to infinity, n goes to infinity, all of this goes to one third, which happens to be less than one, and therefore it converges. Good? Everybody? Okay, so, so even from this example, you can see that when I kind of like sporadically throw numbers, which I plug in for x, it behaves differently at different x's. At zero it converges, at one it diverges, at negative one it converges, at two it diverges, at one third it converges. And you can try throwing in other numbers and s at each one you're going to need to study it somehow using different tests and, and get a decide whether it converges or not. Let's do another example. Example two. So let's look at sigma. Now I'm going to start from zero. Uh, one over n factorial x to the n. Zero factorial is one by definition. That's why this is defined. Okay. So what this is when x equals zero, sorry. When, when n equals 0, I just get 1, plus, when n equals 1, I get x, plus x squared over 2 factorial, plus x cubed over 3 factorial, plus dot, dot, dot. Right? At 0, I get this. This is the free coefficient, a0. Right? So... These are the ANs, these are the coefficients. And let's start checking some points, some x's which we can plug in. So when we plug in x0 equals 0, what do we get? Well, we don't get a sum of zeros, we get 1 plus all these zeros. Okay? 1 plus all these zeros. So we get <coughs> sigma... Um, Let's write 1 plus sum of zeros. So we get just 1. And of course it converges. What happens when you plug in x0, any positive number, any positive number, and since all of them are going to behave the same, I'm just going to not distinguish. Okay, so take any positive number, plug it in here. Remember, now it's a fixed number. So we get sigma x0 to the power n divided by n factorial, where x0 is now a fixed number, a fixed positive number. What would you want to apply to this? Which test? Ratio. Ratio. Remember, you see factorial? Say ratio. Don't think. Okay? The, the, the reason is obvious, right? The, in the ratio, all these factorials cancel out precisely. We've seen it a few times and we're going to see it one more time now. Okay? And that's the only one that's going to do this trick. So x0 is positive, therefore this is a positive series. So let's ratio it. So by ratio, test, what do we get? we get x0 to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. That's a n plus 1 times the reciprocal of a n or divided by a n. So I get n factorial divided by x0 to the power n. Right? Cancellations n factorial and n plus 1 factorial <coughs> Just leave a poor old n plus 1 in the bottom. And the, the powers of x0 just leave a 
x0 on the top. Yeah, n factorial and n plus 1 factorial. Yes, yes, I see, but like if we say this is equal to that directly, is this okay? Yeah. So, so what happens when n goes to infinity? Remember, we're applying the ratio test. We want to know what happens when n goes to infinity. Whatever x0 is, whatever x0 is, it's a fixed number. When n goes to infinity, what does this go to? Zero. zero. No matter what x0 is, which is less than 1. And therefore, this converges. So maybe we should add, okay, by ratio test, it converges. And this is the argument. Do you agree? So this thing converges for any positive x. Good? What if we plug in a negative number into x? What if we take x0, which is less than 0, What happens? Very good. So if we take an x0, which is negative, and plug it in, you can think of it as minus x0, where x0 is positive. In absolute value, you'd get precisely this. And it converges, right? So for x0 less than 0, this thing converges absolutely. Do you agree? So sigma x0 to the power n over n factorial converges absolutely. We can take the absolute value and that would be something like this and we just showed that it converges. Good? Okay. So the conclusion is that for example 2 not depending on what x0 is, it always converges. <coughs> Sorry. No matter what x0 you plug in. Okay? Okay, so from these two examples, we see that, there, that, that many things could happen, and it's kind of obvious that we don't want, whenever we get a power series like this, an infinite polynomial, to just starting throwing in x's and playing guessing games, when would it converge, when would not. There, we hope that there is a more solid theory in the background, which can somehow help us, and there is. So that's what we're going to see now. So first, here's the definition. The collection of x's where the power series sigma a n x to the n converges, this collection is called the domain of convergence. Domain of convergence. That's what I'm defining. And a priori, naively, we see that it could be anything. Just, you know, a bunch of numbers where it does converge and a bunch of numbers where it doesn't. And there co they could be a priori. We don't know how they're related to each other. But the theorem is that, in fact, <coughs> the situation is a lot more friendly. Um... There exists, there exists, I, I don't want to write, okay, I, wanted, I almost wrote a number r, but it's not necessarily a number because it could be infinity. So there exists r, and r is either a number greater than or equal to zero, or it could be infinity. This is not saying that infinity is a number, because you'll see that this r is actually a limit. Okay, so there exists an r, which is a limit of some form. We'll see it in a second. 
such that, such that, for any x which in absolute value is less than r, the power series converges. And for any x which in absolute value is greater than r, the power series diverges. This R is called, um, let's write it here, definition R, this R mentioned in this theorem, is called the radius that's why it's labeled with an R, radius of convergence that's what I'm defining here the, the reason for this word radius so it, it doesn't, it's not really obvious why one would call it radius when talking about real valued functions but if at some point in the future you would encounter what are called complex valued functions, functions not from R to R, but from C to C, the, the, the field of complex numbers, then the field of complex numbers, I don't know if you encountered it already, but if you have, it's, it's, it could be thought of as a plane, right? Have you encountered, have some of you? Okay, so it could be thought of as a plane, and you can do many of this, much of this theory it carries in some way or another to, to, to complex valued functions and there it in fact is a circle and there's a radius of converges. Inside the circle it converges, outside the circle it diverges and R is really a radius. Okay, but for us it's just almost a number. So the picture you should have in mind, the bottom line from this is that there's a picture hiding here. Let, let, wait, 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 wait. Let, let me draw it a second. So the picture is the following. Here, oh, I don't have, oh, let's draw it here. So here's the x-axis. Here's zero. There's this number r. I want another color. There's this number r. Let's just for the sake of the picture assume for a minute that it's not zero and not infinity. So here's r. And here's minus r. And any x you take, which in absolute value is less than r, this is the same as saying x is between r and minus r, right? That you know well by now. So any x you take in this region, let's color it in blue, any x in this region, any x here, The, the, the series converges, converges, and any x outside, it's going to diverge. So if you take any x greater than r, so it's either greater than r or less than minus r, so any x here or here, it diverges. Clear? And this theorem doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you precisely what the domain of convergence is. Why? What's missing in order to know all of the domain of convergence? Right. We don't know. The theorem doesn't tell us what happens at R and at minus R themselves. And the reason they're not mentioned in this theorem is that in different examples, different things can happen. Okay, so in some cases it converts, we'll see examples in a minute. So in some cases it converges at the endpoints, in some cases it doesn't. So we almost know the entire picture just using this theorem. Okay, there is some number r. 
If R is between 0 and infinity, then this is precisely the picture. If R is 0, then the theorem collapses to saying it converges only at 0, because whenever you're bigger than 0, you diverge, right? And if R is infinity, that's just a way of saying it converges everywhere. Clear? So let's look at the two examples we already had. Let's look at the two examples we already had. So let's start with this example, example 2, over here. We said it converges at any x0, so what's the radius of convergence? Infinity. 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 For any x, it converges. What's the domain of convergence here? Right, so, so you can say in this example, in this example, r equals infinity, that's the radius of convergence, and the domain of convergence, this is the radius, and the domain of convergence is minus infinity to infinity, or you can say it's r, but r with a double egg, right? r with a double egg is, is minus infinity to infinity, all the real numbers. Good? Okay, so that's for this one. What about the first example that we had here? Well, it's not completely obvious. Right, so here, r equals 1. That's the radius, radius. We didn't prove it, but in fact, well, we didn't prove that theorem. But in fact, from the calculations we already did, it's obvious. Because we see that at 1 it diverges, and at negative 1 it converges. So the threshold has to be at 1. There's no other choice. So r equals 1 is the radius. What's the domain? The domain is negative 1 closed, because it converges at negative 1, to 1 open, because it diverges at 1. And then for numbers greater than 1, it diverges, 2, for example. And for numbers between negative 1 and 1, like 1 third, it converges, and 0, it converges. Okay. How do we know that it's not a half? Because if it were a half, it would have to diverge. If the radius was one half, it would have to diverge for any number that's out of the interval minus one half to a half. And then it would have to diverge at negative one. It's symmetric, but it converges at negative one. Okay. So that's the answer here, but but the way we found it was still kind of a guessing game. We made some good guesses because we chose to check 1 and negative 1, but it's still a guessing game. <coughs> so there are, on top of this, there are theorems that tell you how to find R in a systematic way, not by guessing. So let's write those down. Any questions until here? Yes? How do we know that there is just, uh, that the domain is split into two parts? One divergence Okay, so th the question is, the question is, why is this the picture? Why don't we have, like, for example, a small area and the divergence area where it converges? So you're asking, why is this the picture? Answer, answer, and I, I, I don't like giving answers like this, but that's the situation. The theorem says it, and you need to prove it, okay? And the proof of this theorem, I it's not too difficult, there's no... Um, you know, any, any new terminology hiding or, or something very... But it, it requires work. It's not an, a so easy theorem at this point. It requires making use of the notion of the supremum and, and there's work to be done here. And I'm skipping it. In fact, I'm skipping most of the theorems in this course. Today we only proved one thing, that 2 equals 1, and even that was false. Okay, so... That's this course. This is an introductory level course to, to calculus. I'm sorry to break this news at the almost last lecture of the semester, but all these proofs exist in books, and of course if you come to me after class I would be happy to, to, to help you uh, decipher them or
give you reference, but we're just not proving everything here. This is a theorem, and it takes half an hour to actually prove. Yes? On, on this example? Yeah, yeah the domain, okay, once you agree that r equals 1 is the radius, the, all, all that remains is to decide what happens at the two endpoints. Because the picture is, again on this board, the picture is this. So if r is 1, then you know that it converges between negative 1 and 1, diverges outside this domain, and you only need to decide what happens at the precise endpoints. And we found, manually, without any theorems, that at minus 1 it converges, and at 1 it diverges, those were these two statements, therefore at minus 1 is in the domain, that's why it's a closed bracket here, and it's an open one here. Good? Okay. So let's take this discussion a step further and write some theorems of how we actually find R itself. How do we find what is R? Ouch. Okay. So there are actually two theorems. So, question. How do we find R? Answer. Two theorems. So I'm going to write the formulas here, but these are actually theorems and they require proof and uh, maybe I want to prove and that. Nah, we don't have time. This is unfortunate. I would love to prove everything. Okay, so the first theorem is the following, r equals 1 over the limit of the nth root of the absolute value of the coefficients. So let's, let's rephrase the question so I don't need to write a lot of stuff. How do we find R for sigma a n x to the n? So a n's are the coefficients. We take the coefficients, put an absolute value on them, now they're positive. Take the nth root, we can do that because it's positive. Take the limit, as n goes to infinity, and take the reciprocal of that. That's r. The only thing that can go wrong is maybe this limit doesn't exist. Not every sequence has a limit. So this is r, providing the limit exists. Providing the limit exists. There is a certain way to strengthen this formula and to have it work even if the limit doesn't exist. It uses a notion which we haven't discussed of the, uh, what's called the lean soup, the, the um, upper limit, but we haven't discussed that. So we're only going to use this. And in fact, there's even another formula, and you can use whichever one works better. The other formula is 1 over the limit, as n goes to infinity, of, instead of the root, the nth root, take the ratio. And again, both of these are providing the limit exists. So this is a 1, 1 over. Okay? And the proof that this is in fact R is very closely related to guess what? Leibniz. Not Leibniz, better guess. The ratio and the ratio and the root test. The proof that this is R is closely related to the ratio test 
It's 1 over the ratio test. Do you see that? And this is 1 over the root test. Right? And that's the, the, the idea of the proof, but I'm not going to write the full proof. Okay, so let's do examples. So let's just... Well, if both of these limits don't exist, in this course we give up. We don't know how to find R. Okay? So I'm not going to give you examples like that. Okay? In general, I said, there's a stronger version of this which, which we, don't, we don't study here. Okay, so let's do the examples that we already had once again. So the first example... So re remember these two, okay? I'm gonna, on one of them I'm going to use this, on the other I'm going to use this. So the first example was this example. Let's find R. We know what the answer has to be because it was kind of evident from this, but let's find it formally. Suppose we didn't know what it was, so let's try the first one. So uh, space, space, space. Um, where am I going to erase? Well, I think we can at this point already erase all the various X's we plugged in. That would give us enough space to work on. So how do we find R? We need to take the reciprocal of the limit of the nth root of the absolute value of the coefficients. This is what I want to calculate. Do you agree? Good? So what's the absolute value of 1 over n? It's 1 over n. What's the nth root of 1 over n? So it's 1 over the limit of 1 over the nth root of n. What's the limit of nth root of n? So this goes to 1. So 1 over this goes to 1. So this limit is 1, right? So it's 1 over 1. So it's just 1. So since it exists, this equals R. Good? Did everybody follow? Okay, let's do... I'll erase this and we can do the second example. These two um, tests have two... No, tests. Th these two formulas are actually attributed to certain mathematicians. They have name, names. I'll write them down in a second. So let's do this example, the second example. So we see factorial. What are we going to use? Ratio. 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 Always. So R is going to be 1 over the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of 1 over n plus 1 factorial divided by, that's a n plus 1, 1 over n factorial. Do you agree that this is what I need to calculate? So what do I get? 1 over the limit as n goes to infinity. The absolute values contribute nothing because everything's positive here. I can multiply by the reciprocal, so I get n factorial over n plus 1 factorial, and, and they cancel out, so I just get 1 over n plus 1. Do you agree? What's this limit? Zero. So what is 1 over 0? Infinity. And remember, this is a limit. It's not a number. Okay? There's no such number as infinity, and 1 over 0 is not the number infinity. R is not a number. R is a limit. So shouldn't we put the limit on the outside? You can put the limit on the outside. It would be the same, the same thing. It's just a different way of writing it. 
Okay. I, I agree that it would actually look better in terms of saying... I agree. I should have done that. That would look more, more kosher. Okay. Good. So what does it mean that R is infinity? It means that for any X, it converges. Good? Okay, let me just go back here and give, th give these things names. So this formula is attributed to D'Alembert. D'Alembert. I think there's a T here. Without the A? What? It's an E here? Is there a T here? There is a T. Is this correct? Okay. Capital A. Like. Fine. And this one is called Koshi Hadamar. Koshi Hadamar. Named after two mathematicians. Koshi we've encountered before. Okay. So... These are the two ways we have of finding R, and we've seen uh, examples of using both. Um, let me write a remark <coughs> now. <coughs> remark. Ah, what do I want to erase? Yeah, let's erase all of this. So apparently with this it erases better. Why not use it? Okay, so there's a, a small generalization of this, which is still called power series, and I haven't, I haven't um, included them so far. So let's write it as a remark. So remark... Sigma n equals zero to infinity. A n. So far, it's it it looks the same as previously, but even if we write x minus some constant c to the power n, is also a power series. Okay, so the, the, what we had before was the, the, the special case where C was zero. Okay? And if you think of this as an infinite polynomial, it's going to be a polynomial where you take powers of the form x minus C, x minus C squared, x minus C cubed, x... We've seen polynomials <coughs> like that. Do you remember where? When we discussed Taylor. Remember that? And in fact, in fact, I'm not sure we'll get to it today, maybe next time, but this is going to be closely related to Taylor. Closely related. So this is also called a power series. And the, the, every, the theory is going to work precisely the same. Everything is going to uh, carry to this general case. But the only difference is going to be that the... the in this picture here, the center, it's going to be symmetric, not about zero, but about C. Okay, so it's going to be C and C plus something and C minus something. That's going to be the R we're going to find. And what I want to do is just do an example. Wait, and C can be positive or negative? Yeah, C can be any number. So what's the reason that it's a minus between them? That's the way I chose to write it, X minus C. Okay, but C can be positive or negative. So let's do an example, and th this, this, so this is example three. This example is going to be, it's going to have more details than the previous two examples. That's a good opportunity to, to kind of review everything we said so far. So let's look at n equals one to infinity. Again, I'm not starting at zero. Ln of n plus one divided by n plus 1, x minus 2 to the power n. Good? 
So, all these are the coefficients, so that even the coefficients here are a bit more involved. And it's a power series centered at 2 rather than centered at 0. Do you see that? Okay. So how do we, how do we study it? So that the first thing to do is denote, let's call it y, equals x minus 2. Then we get a power series instead of x minus 2 here we're going to have a y to the n and it's going to be a good old power series centered at 0 in the variable y. Do you agree? And for that I'm going to find r and find the domain and everything and then I'm going to go back to x. Okay? So let's first find r. So what do I want to use here in order to find the radius of convergence? Okay, so there are oh, good. Okay, so there are two options. Let's look at them again. There's there's the the Cauchy Adama, which is the, the variation of the root test, and there's the D'Alembert, which is the variation of the ratio test. Okay. I I think it's kind of um, obvious here that you'd rather try a ratio argument than a root argument. The nth root of ln of something, bleh. Okay, so let's do the ratio argument. So what is a n plus 1 divided by a n? The a n's are positive, so I don't need the absolute value. I just need to look at this quotient, take the limit, do 1 over that. That's the radius, right? So what is this thing? This is ln of n plus 1 plus 1, of n plus 2, divided by n plus 1 plus 1, n plus 2, divided by a n. So I'm, again, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal, n plus 1 divided by ln of n plus 1. Good? Now I'm going to rewrite this with the LNs sitting together. And this n plus 1 over n plus 2, I'll right away make the next step and divide top and bottom by n. So I get 1 plus 1 over n divided by uh, 1 plus 2 over n. Everybody with me? Okay, so what's the limit of this thing? This thing goes to 1, that's obvious, right? Good? So, as n goes to infinity, this factor goes to 1. What about this thing? What? ln of n plus 2 divided by ln of n plus 1. What's the limit as n goes to infinity? Right, y y you really want to do l'hôpital to this, right? It's an infinity over infinity situation. You want to do l'hôpital and you can even see the next step that it's going to be easy. Can you do l'hôpital to this? Why not? Because it's a sequence. And l'hôpital says take the derivative. Right, we're going to have to convert to the function do l'hôpital there, and then return to sequences via Heine's theorem. Okay? You can't take derivatives of sequences. That's not defined. Okay? So, this is a side calculation. Side calculation. Side. ln of x plus 2 divided by ln of x plus 1 the limit of, ah, didn't leave enough space. The limit of this thing, limit as x goes to infinity, of this thing, here it's an infinity over infinity situation, I can do l'hôpital. So l'hôpital, infinity over infinity. So I get the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x plus 2 
divided by 1 over x plus 1. Everybody following? This is stuff we know from long ago. I told you that, that in this topic, everything's going to come in, right? So, I can multiply by the reciprocal. It's x plus 1 over x plus 2. And just like this, same thing, the limit here is what? 1. So the limit of this function as x goes to infinity is 1. Therefore, by what? By Heine's theorem, any sequence I plug which goes to infinity, in particular the sequence xn equals n, would also have the same limit. So, this also goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. And the reason for that is, let's write it like this. Let's be artistic here. So this follows from this using Heine. The sequence is the xn equals n. I'm just plugging the sequence n, which goes to infinity. So all in all, this thing, as n goes to infinity, goes to 1. And where are we? What are we doing? What was this calculation? Right, this, the limit of this, 1 over that is r, right? So 1 over 1 is still 1, so the conclusion is that the r for this thing in y, so let's write a new board, so r equals 1 over 1, which is 1, using uh, d'Alembert for the uh, power series in y, in the variable y. Good? Hence, the power series in y, in the variable y, in y, converges Four. So let's write it this way. <coughs> so um, let's just write it like this. I, I don't want to write too many words. So it converges for y between one and negative one. It diverges for y's which are greater than one, and it diverges for y's <coughs> which are less than negative one. And we still don't know what happens at y equals 1 and at y equals negative 1. Do you agree? Those are the endpoints, which we have to check manually, because the theorem doesn't account for them. So therefore it converges, now we go back to x's, for, what was y? y was x minus 2, remember? So it converges for x minus 2 between 1 and negative 1. So it converges for x between 3 and 1. The r is still 1 if you think of it centered at 2, which is that c in the, in the general uh, way of writing. Good? So we're not done. We still have to check manually what happens when x equals 1 and what happens when x equals 3. Clear? Everybody good? Questions? Okay, so what happens when x equals... So this was using the theorem. This was saying we found r using the either d'Alembert or cauchy Adamar. We found r... And the general statement is, between minus r and r, it converges for any x you take there. Greater than r, less than minus r, it diverges for any x you take there. Theorem doesn't tell you what happens at r and at minus r. You have to check that manually, and in each example, totally different things will happen. Good? So now we have to do that. And sometimes that's most of the work. Sometimes that's, sometimes finding r, so... Deciphering the general picture 
takes less work than just checking those two little annoying endpoints. Okay, so when x equals, which one do we want to do first? Okay, let's do x equals 1. That's one endpoint, this endpoint. What do we get? So I have to look back at the original series. This was the original series. I have to plug in 1. I get a number series. I have to check if it converges or not. And at my disposal are all the various tests that I had for checking convergence. So when I plug in 1, what do I get? 1 minus 2, negative 1 to the power n, calls for what? For Leibniz. Smells like Leibniz. So let's write what we get. So we get sigma n equals 1 to infinity ln of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 times negative 1 to the power n. That's what we get when we plug in x equals 1. Okay. In order for this to be Leibniz, what do we need to show? That what is monotone decreasing? Right. So this is the alternating signs part. This will, the, thi the, the Leibniz theorem will take care of this. But in order for the Leibniz theorem to be valid, we have to check that its conditions hold. And the conditions are that just this sequence has to be positive. Is it positive? Yeah, that's obvious, right? It has to be monotone decreasing, and its limit has to be zero. That's not obvious. Do you agree? Okay. So... How do we check that the limit of ln of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, we need to show that the limit as n goes to infinity, we need to show that th this limit is 0. Right. Again, it, it's an infinity over infinity situation. It's really calling for L'Hopital, but we can't L'Hopital a sequence. We need to take the function, do L'Hopital, and plug in the sequence using Heine. I, I really don't have difficulty understanding the take the function of the sequence. It's not take the function of the sequence. It's, it's a bit more complicated. It's take a function for which when you plug in, when you plug in a sequence, you would get this. Okay? That was Heine's theorem. Heine's theorem we discussed at, at, at length because we're using it all the time. The point is, I want to do L'Hopital, I can't. I can't take derivatives of sequences. There's no such thing. Okay? So what I do here, again, is I look at the function ln of x plus 1 over x plus 1, there, and take x to infinity. There, I can do L'Hopital. I'm not going to write it again, so I'm just going to write here, use function plus L'Hopital plus Heine. Okay? The details are just like before. So when you take the function with x's, you can do L'Hopital. You get 1 over, uh, 1 over x plus 1 divided by 1. Right? When x goes to infinity, the limit is 0. And therefore, for any sequence you plug in which goes to infinity, in particular the sequence a n equals n, you get the same limit. Okay? If this is still not clear what just happened here, then th that's a certain gap that I can't fill in right now quickly. Please see me later and, and I'll be happy to explain this again. But this is important. You need to fill in this gap. Okay? So this is one, one thing. So that's the statement that the sequence goes to zero. Um, ln of n plus 1 over n plus 1 is clearly positive. That is obvious. For any n you plug in, starting at 1, you get positive numbers. Here you don't have to say anything else. And what's the third thing that we need to show? That it's decreasing. How do you show that this thing is decreasing? 
Okay, so there are different ways. You can do different things. You can try showing this by induction. Might work, might not. Okay, and there was another suggestion there, which is also good to know and many times useful. Let's do it now. You can look at the function. It, it's not, there's no heine involved because we're not, we're not taking limits. So it's not a heine statement. Just let's look at the function, show that the function is decreasing. Therefore, if we just take n's, just look at the function on the naturals, it would still be decreasing. Do you agree? So that's kind of a statement. If we have a function, if we have a function that looks like this, it's a decreasing function, then if we look at it values just on the natural numbers, it would be a decreasing sequence. Do you agree? Okay, so ln of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 is decreasing since ln of x plus 1 divided by x plus 1 is decreasing as a function. First, of, b before proving this, do you agree to this statement? How do we know that it's before we prove that, do you agree to this statement? That if this is a decreasing function, then when we plug in ends, this is a decreasing sequence. Do you agree just to this statement? Everybody? And there's no heine here. It's not, a, it's not a question of limits. It's just, if a function is decreasing and you look at its value only on naturals, it would be a, na a decreasing sequence. Good? <coughs> and the suggestion we got here from the audience was, in order to prove that this is a decreasing function, how do you prove a function is decreasing? Take the derivative, show the derivative is negative. Right? Remember that? I told you everything is coming in today. This is a good review. Today and next time, last time, it's going to be a good review of almost everything we did. So in order to show that this is a decreasing function, we need to take its derivative and show that the derivative is negative. So let's quickly do that. Uh, what can we erase? Let's erase this. So, let's write, indeed, what's the derivative of ln of x plus 1? So this is the justification for that last statement that we wrote. What's the derivative of ln of x plus 1 over x plus 1? <coughs> okay, let's write, f of x equals ln of x plus 1 over x plus 1, indeed. If this is f of x, then what is f prime of x? Note that we're now doing the derivative of a quotient. Not l'hopital, not derivative of top and derivative of bottom. The quotient rule. So it's the derivative of the top, 1 over x plus 1, times the bottom untouched, x plus 1, minus the derivative of the bottom, which is just 1, times the top untouched, <coughs> divided by the bottom squared. This was quotient rule, right? Okay, this is just a fancy way of writing 1. So we get 1 minus ln of x plus 1, divided by x plus 1 squared. Do you agree? And the denominator is always positive, because it's squared. And the top, well, once x exceeds what? Uh, ln of 1. No, e minus 1 minus ln something. Right, one, once x exceeds something, that's, that's mature. Uh, e minus 1, that's 0. Okay, what, no, I thought you said something. That, I like that even better. It doesn't really matter where, but from a certain x onwards, 1 minus ln of x is going to be negative. So this is less than 0 for from x 
a certain X. <laughs> I missed the joke. I never want to miss a joke. What did you say? Oh, we're going to use Taylor. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to use everything. Where are the snakes? Right. You should ask, where are the snakes? We didn't do integrals yet. Everything. Everything's going to... This is the grand finale of this course. Well, it's going to be next time. Okay, so, so this is less than zero. The derivative is less than zero from a certain x. Therefore, the function is decreasing. Okay? From a certain x, so therefore the, the, the sequence is decreasing from a certain n. That doesn't matter if at the beginning it's still positive. So all this argument says, so all of this was in, 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 in a side note, and that was justification for this. So we showed the three conditions for Leibniz. The limit of the sequence is zero, it's a positive sequence, and it's a decreasing sequence. Therefore, this thing converges by Leibniz. And it took some work. <coughs> okay, are we done? Now we, can use now we need to check three. <laughs> okay, so you can see the, the devil's in the details. It, it's okay. So now we need to check the point three. So the point checking the point three is going to this board and plugging in a three into here. So you get three minus two, which is one. One to the n is one. So you just get this sequence. Let's write that. So for x equals 3, we get sigma ln of n plus 1 over n plus 1. What can you say about this? Diverges, I agree. Why? Comparison to what? Good. So ln of n plus 1 over n plus 1, good, very good, is greater than 1 over n plus 1 once ln of n plus 1 exceeds 1. So from a certain n onwards, what, 2 or 3? Or, do you agree? Yep. And this is positive. Sigma 1 over n plus 1 diverges. It's, it's a shift of 1 over n. You can do the limit comparison test here, or you cannot write anything. It's too obvious. Therefore, by the comparison test, comparison test, um, this thing diverges it well, as well. Diverges. Good? So all in all, all these arguments boil down to this statement. Let's go back to this thing. That the domain of converges, convergence for this thing is, converges for x is less than 3, strictly less than 3, and greater than or equal to one. That's the domain of convergence. Okay. Questions? Does it matter if it's uh, for a power series if it starts from n equals zero or n equals one? It doesn't matter if it starts from n equals zero or n equals one. It just matter that would th the only thing that says is is there a free coefficient or not? Okay. That's the only thing that that it determines. Okay, so this example, even in this short example, we used a lot of things, right? We used theorems about functions and derivatives and l'hopital and passing from functions to sequences using Heine and we used uh, what Leibniz and the comparison test and a lot of things go inside just doing an example like this and there's more to it next time. So next time we're gonna, everything we did so far was Somebody gives us a, a, a power series 
All we said so far, really not a lot, was where does it converge and where does it diverge? For which axis? Okay, it's, it's a solid theory, but that's not saying too much. What we're going to do next time is say how we use these power series, what is their use, and what we're going to see is that they generalize Taylor polynomials. These are called Taylor series, and we'll see why. Okay? And we'll see how to find them for specific functions, and how to generate them from specific <coughs> functions and backwards, and so on.